we are going to hear again about the commandment, the first one, that we shall have no other gods before us. And those of you who were here two weeks ago said, didn't we cover that? And Aaron and I sat down together and said, this is clearly the most challenging of all the commandments, is not having other gods. And he said, I think it really deserves two rounds. And so that's what we're going to deal with today. <clears throat> so we're at the beginning of our, of our series on the Ten Commandments, and if you are streaming online or you're coming for the first time, uh, we're going to review just a little bit about the Ten Commandments. And um, I want to begin with some common and perhaps a little humorous misunderstandings that we may have about the Ten Commandments. So here we're going to see Moses. And Moses is explaining to the people, so if I understand correctly, it's a 10-step program with cloud support. <laughs> but it is true that many people feel that the Ten Commandments are a little bit like the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous, or they think of the Ten Commandments as kind of a self-help program, a practical guide for living, which of course is true. But that's not necessarily related to our relationship with God and our understanding of who God is. And let's be honest, if the Ten Commandments are separated from God, they lose their power, they lose their authority, they become open to manipulation for their own purposes, or they can be just dismissed as an ancient and irrelevant code given to a punitive and... and and kind of primitive tribe. Embedded in the Ten Commandments, however, is the very nature of who God is. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt and into the house, out of the house of slavery. Two weeks ago, Pastor Aaron gave an excellent introduction to the commandments, and he emphasized that the commandments arose out of God's liberating action. God reminds the Israelites, and yes, he reminds us this very morning that he intends to liberate us from whatever enslaves us because he is the God who longs to bring us freedom. Craig Barnes, in his wonderful book on the Heidel Catechism called Body and Soul, states that as a pastor, he was always simply confounded by how many people prefer the misery that they know to the mystery they do not know. Yes, even today, the human soul has a way of reflecting the Hebrews' tendency to look back over the shoulders to the good flesh pots in Egypt because they prefer that to the arduous and mysterious road to freedom. The misery they know versus the mystery they don't know. Now, if you are here this morning and you don't feel enslaved to anything, the next 15 minutes are going to be rather dull and irrelevant. And I often think of what Simone Weil famously said, Christianity is a religion for slaves, and unless you're a slave, you can't understand it. The Ten Commandments cannot be separated from the God who shared them, and we cannot understand this first commandment <clears throat> until we understand that God longs for us to be free and longs to mold us in his image. Well, a second misunderstanding is that the Ten Commandments are a set of rules that function as straitjackets. <laughs> you never let us do anything. <laughs> and the language of thou shalt not may reinforce this culture, because in our culture today, there is not much going on that helps us understand the relationship between having boundaries 
and having freedom. We think of boundaries as externally imposed limitations and restrictions to keep us from being who we are truly meant to be. And we think of freedom as a paradise of unlimited options. You know, it wasn't until I studied classical ballet for many years that I came to understand the relationship between limits and freedom. And because I was always wildly flinging myself around the living room <clears throat> during my parents' cocktail hour every night, and because they wanted another outlet for my passionate pursuit of wild movement, they signed me up at the age of six for classical ballet lessons. Was I in for a shock when I began those lessons at Alexander Saviska's ballet studio on Parker Street in Berkeley, California? Because we spent the first 30 minutes doing plies, bat montandus, at the bar, of course, B-A-R-R-E, Ron de Jambes, so you're not confused. Ron de Jambes, grand battements, first with the right leg eight times, then with the left leg eight times or 12 times, for 30 minutes, followed by very specific repetitive movements in the center of the studio. The same darn thing. Every day, and I mean six days a week. That's how often they sent me. That tells you something. And 52 weeks a year, that tells you something else. <clears throat> Many children drop out of this within a year because they feel like they have no freedom. Of course, the exercises became more challenging and varied, but I learned that it was this restricted, disciplined, repetitive activity that gave me, as it gives all dancers, the freedom elasticity, grace, and ability to overcome the limits of gravity and physiology. In other words, it is those restrictive discipline movements that give positive freedom. And the Ten Commandments are for our human freedom and thriving. So, not so fast. What about health care? <clears throat> A third misunderstanding is that the Ten Commandments are for the goodness of the social order, civic harmony, and they are indeed. And <laughs> we, don't, we understand that better this week than ever. But also that they should be posted in schools, city halls, courtrooms, and other government buildings. And sadly, there have been numerous courtroom battles about where the Ten Commandments should be displayed or can be displayed. Some Christians see their removal from public buildings as an attack on, on the Jewish Christian faith. Atheists, on the other hand, see their removal as mandatory in a society that prizes freedom of religion or freedom from religion. But as Adam Hamilton states in his excellent book on the Ten Commandments, it is not the public display of the Ten Commandments that seems important to God. They were, after all, originally placed within the Ark of the Covenant, not on public display. And he continues, and I would underline, what God longs for is that the commandments are written in our hearts. The time is coming, declares the Lord in Jeremiah, when I will put my instructions within them and engrave them within our hearts, their hearts. Now, Pastor Aaron emphasized how we, like the Israelites, are still influenced by the gods in the surrounding culture. And as he noted countless other gods, constantly were surrounding the Israelites, the gods of the Canaanites and the Moabites, and later the gods of the Assyrians and the Babylonians. 
which had an unrelenting and seductive power over the Israelites. Now, this may be one of the most important things I say today, this week, this time. Whenever life felt chaotic or out of control, the people of Israel were tempted to call upon the false gods. Listen to who they were in ancient Israel. Baal was the god of money and prosperity, but the primary attraction to Baal wasn't a pretty statue. It was the promise of a good economy. For the nations around Israel, Baal was the rider of the clouds who brought rains and blessed the earth. And when Baal showed up, the heavens poured down on that dry desert earth. The rivers ran with honey. Mothers gave birth to healthy children. So the Israelites continued to worship Yahweh, but if there was a drought or wild economic inflation, they would turn to Baal, to their ritual. Asherah was the goddess of fertility and sexuality. Because of Israel's incomplete conquest of Canaan, Canaanite Asherah worship survived and plagued Israel starting soon after Joshua died. And Israelite women who worshipped Yahweh would secretly turn to Asherah if they were having trouble getting pregnant. When life seems out of control, we turn to the false gods. Molech, Ashur, and Marduk were the gods of military power, and they took different forms at different times. But they were always there. They were always around. Aaron showed us the archaeological evidence for these these false gods made of stone and wood. But let's entertain for one moment the possibility that these gods are still among us. Not by those names, of course. Not carved in wood or stone, but hidden and unlabeled. So in our remaining time together, I want us to do the very hard and painful work of considering the gods we cannot see, which are in competition with the one true God who is the source and sustainer of life. In a world of individualism and moral relativism, Many Americans, even some who call themselves Christians, prefer a new commandment. This is it. Just do your own thing as long as you don't hurt anybody. Atheists seem to resent the intrusion of the Ten Commandments because they are absolute. In fact, the Bible Project, which You've heard about some of you. The Big Ten, I call them, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, are really a series of vows that, that God wants Israelites to take. And he forms this ragtag group of ex-slaves into a holy nation. But today, in a sea of relativity, the Big Ten seem out of place but with some notable exceptions. Not long ago, there was a nationally known figure who said this at a Duke University commencement event. This is what he said. We have actually convinced ourselves that slogans will save us. Shoot up if you must, but use a clean needle. Enjoy sex whenever and with whomever you wish, but use protection. And then he continued, no. The answer is no. Not because it isn't cool or smart or because you might end up in jail or dying, but because it's wrong. Because we have spent 5,000 years as a race trying to drag ourselves out of the primeval slime by searching for truth. 
in its purest form, truth is not a polite tap on the shoulders. It is an authoritative reproach. What Moses brought down from Mount Sinai were not the ten suggestions. Who, you might ask, said these words? Was it a fire and brimstone preacher, some right-wing fundamentalist? Was it some cranky old man who got lucky, made a bundle, and made a big donation to the university and was invited to speak to at their commencement? No. It was the late Ted Koppel an investigative journalist of Nightline, an anchorman of ABC News, a kind of mainstream media, and a man who was a lifelong keen observer of the human condition and the human dilemma. The graduates and their parents, I'm pleased to tell you, gave him a standing ovation. Now, let's remember that the Ten Commandments are for believers. They're for Christians and Jews. How are we believers doing with these commandments? The Gallup poll found out that about eight out of ten Americans consider themselves Christian in kind of a generic way. But only half of them could recall five of the commandments. And secularists had a really good laugh a few years back. Comedian Stephen Colbert asked Georgia Congressman Lynn Westmoreland, who had co-sponsored a bill requiring the display of the Ten Commandments in the House and Senate chambers. He asked him this, well, what are the Ten Commandments? Asked this to Representative Westmoreland. And Westmoreland had to struggle to come up with three. More importantly, Gallup discovered that the Ten Commandments left almost no impression on the lifestyle of believers. Quote, we find there's very little difference in ethical behavior between churchgoers, notice churchgoers, not believers, churchgoers, and those who are not active religiously, Gallup announced. You know, Standing in a garage doesn't make you a car. <laughs> Coming to church and being a church goer doesn't make you a person of faith or a Christian. Gallup said the levels of lying, cheating, adultery, stealing are remarkably similar in both groups. Well, that's a sobering thought. So, when God's top ten debuted, Moses was not rewarded with a standing ovation. In fact, we're told in Exodus 20:18 that there was fear and trembling among the Israelites. The giving of the, of the law occurred about three months after this ragtag band of Israelites, ex-slaves, made their dash for freedom. They were far from Pharaoh and the comforts of civilization. Living on manna and quail, they were marching across the waterless wastelands, fighting off the Amalekites. They were weak and battered strangers in a strange land. But their most terrifying challenge was yet to come when they were presented with the Big Ten. And that was only the beginning, because you know what? 613 more laws would follow. But it was that law, that covenant law given by Yahweh, that big ten that was to form them into a holy nation. And at this point, you might be saying, hey, I thought we weren't under the law anymore. And my answer to that is, you are right. We are not under law. We are not under the law. We are under grace. So let me say a few more words about this first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. We can sum it up in two statements. You must have a God, okay? You must have only one God. 
Joy Davidson, wife of C.S. Lewis, wrote this. Whatever we desire, whatever we love, whatever we find worth suffering for will be the Dead Sea fruit in our mouths unless we remember that God comes first. And so I believe that this first word from God is the most important word. But it's also the most difficult to live. And that's why we're spending two Sundays on it. And we, not unlike the Israelites, are prone to worshiping that which is not God, and it is that violation that does us the most harm. Friends, the one characteristic of all false gods that they all have in common is that they will inevitably disappoint us. They will let us down. The first word from God, no other God, saves us from our delusions. And I love that song that Bob Dylan wrote called, You're Going to Have to Serve Somebody. You may be an ambassador to England or to France. You might like to gamble. You might like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You might be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you are going to have to serve somebody. Don't forget that. And who will it be? Now, people have a hard time in this introduction to the commandments with God saying, I'm a jealous God. And the word jealous evokes an image of an angry young man who bangs his fist on the table at the restaurant because he doesn't like this kind of casual banter going on between the wait person and his lover across the table. But that is not the meaning of jealous here. It, the better translation is, I am a passionate God. Much better translation. God is passionate about us. And it is God's most positive attribute. Think about it. Supposing your spouse or lover said to you, I don't care if you have affairs with other people. It makes no difference to me. How would you feel? More importantly, would you feel that you were cherished or you were loved? That word jealous is not possessive because it really is at the very heart of how God feels about us with this radical, unconditional, inexplicable love. Dearly beloved, God is passionate for you, for you, for you, for all of you. Now, some of our gods are easy to see, like our other gods, ten Porsches housed in a barn. That might reveal a problem of obsessive excess. Or collections that take over an entire house, I've seen that. Addictions, pornography, jewelry, popularity, body size, stock portfolio a collection of houses around the world, or annual travel to exotic places that you must do in order to remain happy. These are not statues or golden calves, but they can be idols. Other gods just simply means that which takes the place of God. What is especially insidious is that those other gods which actually could be labeled could be labeled as good or beneficial. But the pivotal question is, do these invisible gods become our source of security and of hope? What is the source of our ultimate devotion? We discussed this question with the whole staff last Tuesday. 
and they acknowledge that even beneficial things like work, career, loving one's country, lifestyle, questing for self-esteem, capitalism, the stock market, success, even family or church, could become the idols that we don't see. It's a paradoxical and challenging list. And interestingly enough, just five ga- days ago, Carolyn Chen, who's a sociology professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and co-director of the Berkeley Center for the Study of Religion, wrote a piece in the New York Times in which she observed that work has become the most powerful false idol. The workplace being the primary place where Americans now seek out meaning and purpose. And she wrote this, Work is replacing, and in some cases, even taking the form of religion among many of Americans, America's professional. And in her new book, Work, Pray, Code, Dr. Chen interviewed over 100 tech workers in Silicon Valley, and she wrote, I discovered during my research the gospel of work is thin gruel, an ethically empty solution to meet our essential need for meaning and belonging. And it is starving us as individuals and communities. She said that across different faith communities in Silicon Valley, clergy members are saying that their congregations are dwindling because people are too busy working, often 70 hours a week, or they're resting from the exhaustion of working. And then, do you know that even church can become an idol? Church? Imagine that. Seven years ago, when I lived in Portland, Oregon, I was in charge of helping the First Presbyterian Church of Portland heal some deep divisions within the congregation, a division that was so profound that, so profound that they were on the verge of a split. So we had a task force. I was the chair of this task force. We began exploring the culture of the church. And you should know that the First Presbyterian Church of Portland is a historical landmark church built in the Victorian Gothic style and financed by the lumber barons of the 1890s. And this building is an absolutely exquisite sanctuary made of beautiful wood and a priceless Jekyll pipe organ with 3,550 pipes. And when our task force surveyed the congregation in writing and asked them questions, a disturbing number of members wrote, if something happened to this sanctuary, I'd be out of here. In other words, the beautiful carved wood sanctuary was their point of identity and attachment. They had what I call an edifice complex. The church majored in elegant traditional worship, and their worst fear, when you know what their worst fear was? Contemporary worship. (laughs) Even a church, even a particular style of worship can become a false god, an idol. Sometimes the idol that most competes with God is, and this one is really hard for us to hear, is the family. And if this is hard for you to think about, remember those Godfather movies? What we won't do in the name of the family. Seriously, many people in this country, not all people, obviously, people below the poverty level, but we overspend, we overindulge, and we don't leave enough room for putting energies or financial resources outside of our families, for God's work among the poor in the community, 
for the well-being of the church, for a cause that is making a difference in other people's lives. And believe me, I love my family, my children, my grandchildren, and I have sacrificed for them. But I will tell you, I have an ongoing struggle interiorly every time I'm giving assistance. What is essential? What is too much? And is God at the center of my sacrifice? I have to ask this con continuously. I want to leave you with this thought. Sam Hunegaard, CEO of the largest, one of the largest hospitals in Kansas City, told Pastor Adam Hamilton what he observed about this first commandment of no other gods. And this is what he said. In my work, the people who walk through our doors at the hospital are usually sick, except those giving birth. And when they are sick, they begin thinking about what really matters. The sicker they are, the less things they thought were important matter. And for those we cannot heal, for whom death draws near, there is only one who remains in whom we can find, in whom they can find their hope. I think that is why God calls us to have no other gods before him. Let us pray. O oh God, the dearest idol we have known, whoever that idol be, Help us to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. Amen.